Hello everyone, Karnasa here and welcome back to Kerbal Gets Real, the next millennia. To kick off proceedings today, we are going to be launching a new super heavy launch vehicle. This is the Olympus One. The Olympus One can take about 160 tons to low Earth orbit and its primary purpose at the moment is going to be sending over components to my new modular moon base. That is, of course, the name of the episode and that is going to be the primary focus of today. As this is a new launch vehicle, I do kind of want to delve into the details of this just a little bit. So the first stage is going to be powered by 21 sea level Raptor engines, obviously burning Methalox. Now, the reason why I've gone for these is Methalox is a bit more efficient than Keralox, so we get a bit of extra Delta V with these. And the Raptors, they have unlimited ignitions, which is going to be really good for attempting a propulsive landing. There are going to be some limitations of using those Raptor engines, and the main one that does spring to mind is we do need an awful lot of those to lift something this large to low Earth orbit. So I am going to be suffering from a few dropped frames, a few frame rate issues, but do not worry. As always, I will speed this up in post-processing, which you can kind of see now anyway. So I'm currently trying to return the Olympus One booster safely back to the surface of the Earth and, you know, try and land it propulsively. In order to do this, I did perform a bit of a slowdown burn using a single Raptor engine in the center of that booster to try and mitigate most of the atmospheric effects we would feel when we came back down. We did see a little bit of re-entry heating, but nothing too major. Now we fired up that Raptor again, and unfortunately, mere meters from the ground, we run out of fuel, and we lose the landing legs. The second stage of the Olympus launch vehicle is going to be powered by a new engine, the Cobra, a large Hydrolox engine developed by Pratt & Whitney in 2003. I am using the Cobra H variant, which does give me a few ignitions, it's slightly more powerful, and it has a bit of a better specific impulse. But that is basically it for the Olympus. Now let's focus on this mission, and what we can see at the moment is essentially fish number two. <laughs> so the center of mass on this translunar injection stage was kind of all wonky and weird, due to the fact that this is a very bizarre shaped craft. Yeah, the gimbal on that RL23P that is powering our translunar injection stage, it kind of made it swim through space like a fish does through water. And the reason why it's called fish number two, if you haven't seen Kerbal Gets Real, one of my lunar orbiters that I developed in that series did exactly the same thing. Not entirely sure why it did that, but yeah, it's a bit of a throwback. Anyway, we have made our way over to the moon and we have performed our capture burn. So we're going to ditch that translunar injection stage and we're going to begin setting down on the surface. So in order to begin our descent, I need to do a little bit of transposition and docking because in order to fit this nice and snugly inside a payload fairing, well, I couldn't have this sky crane module sticking out the side of the tank, which is where it needs to be in order to set this down. So it is just a quick little docking maneuver to attach this sky crane. And then we can begin firing up those twin Super Draco engines, the two sets of those to bring this down. So we have begun doing that now, and it will be mere moments before we are touched down on the surface of the moon. So this mission is called The Lot, or the Lunar Outpost Tortoise Tank. And I did design this in a live stream, and that was the name given to this vehicle. And I kind of wanted to go for a tank because it's slightly different, it looks interesting. I could get to use Kerbal Foundries, which is a mod that I've never really used an awful lot. And I just thought it kind of looked cool, it was, it was something different. The main focus of this mission, well, when we set down our Muna module bases, when we set down our Muna base modules even, I need a way of maneuvering them, I need a way of connecting them all together. So that's what this is going to be doing, that's why we have a large NASA docking port on the back, so we can grab onto those modules and shimmy them around on the surface of the moon and hopefully put them exactly where I want to. So we're going to take a break from lunar operations because I do have a Mars transfer window open up and I do want to utilize that. We are going to be sending three separate missions in this transfer window and this will be the first. This is going to be MPOST-03, which stands for the Mars Polar Orbiter Scanner and Topography. Essentially, this is going to be a scansat that I put in a polar inclination of Mars because I want some of those beautiful detailed maps of the surface. The reason why I want these is because at some point in this series, I do really want to set up a Mars surface base. 
and it would be really interesting to know where all of the valuable resources are. I imagine, like I am doing with the Lunar South Pole outpost, I will probably go for one of the poles due to the fact that there will be water there. And water is, of course, very, very crucial for a long-term outpost. We can make sure that our Kerbinauts have something to drink and we can also produce rocket fuel out of that. If we electrolyze the water that we find on the surface into oxygen and hydrogen, we can then liquefy those two elements into liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, which is, of course, hydrolox which is what I use for a lot of my rockets. So now on the 14th of June 2003, we are going to jump to a big mission in this Mars transfer window. Unfortunately, due to some bad timing on my behalf, I was not able to go to Mars straight away with that first probe. Luckily, the trans-Mars injection stage does have a lot of multi-layer insulation on it, so the hydrolox that is going to be powering that stage should not boil off. At least that's what I was telling myself when I left it there in orbit for 14 days. Anyway, that's enough about that first probe. This is the MSSR as well as the M Relay. Two missions for the price of one. The M Relay is pretty much self-explanatory. We are going to be sending a relay network over to Mars, but the MSSR, now that is going to be exciting. We are going to be attempting to do a sample return from Phobos. It is the Mars Satellite Sample Return Mission. And if my calculations are correct, we should have enough Delta V to be able to perform that. What you witnessed just there was me cutting the throttle on the Orpheus booster accidentally and running out of ignition, so it tipped over, and the second one, the engine wouldn't fire up at all. But yet it somehow managed to land at 57 meters per second. Now, the reason why I have launched these missions on the same rocket is when I get to Mars, I thought it would be okay if I had my relay network in the inclination of Phobos. You can see now I've got my map view up and I am trying to attempt to get that as close as possible as soon as we enter Mars's sphere of influence. Both of the missions are going to be captured by a single capture stage and I thought this was an economical way of getting both of these missions to Mars. Also, it does mean that I could use the Orpheus Heavy again and I really haven't been using that rocket an awful lot. Now, just a single day later, we are going to be launching the last mission of this Mars transfer window, and this is going to be M-Glide. I did try and do a design of this where we could launch this at the same time as the Polar Orbiter. Unfortunately, both of those missions together would have weighed too much to fit into an Orpheus Heavy, and I really did not want to spend the funds on an Olympus to get an unmanned mission over to Mars. I also did design a rover, and that was going to be the last launch, but I wanted to only launch three things in this transfer window. So, now with the payload deployed, we can see what the M-Glide is going to be all about. It is going to be a glider. I want to send a plane to Mars so we can fly through the atmosphere. I have done a bit of testing on this, and two out of three tests, it did succeed, and it managed to safely land on the surface of Mars. That one out of three is a little bit concerning, but anyway, you may be thinking to yourself, that looks more like a dart than it does a glider. I am going to be using Infernal Robotics so that I can extend those wings. We could see a little bit of wobble there caused by the Infernal Robotics. That's why it is quite hard to fly this contraption. Essentially, I want the glider to fly over one of the poles so it can take some photos with a camera that it does have mounted on the bottom of it. But that is our Mars transfer window done. We are now coming back to that initial satellite that I did leave for two weeks in low Earth orbit. Luckily, I did have... Well, I didn't suffer enough boil off to really have any problems getting over to Mars. There we go, the beautiful red planet. We are coming for you, and we are coming with darty planes. Y yeah, planes. So with our Mars transfer window all wrapped up, it is time to turn back to the moon. And on the 2nd of July, 2003, yes, that is a typo, my bad. We are going to be launching the Basic Environment and Lunar Ladder Extension Initial Node. This is the core part of the base. This is going to be where every single additional part that we land will attach to. I've currently got four docking ports on this, and what I'm going to do with all of the additional modules that I design, I'll have two docking ports on each of those. Maybe some will have slightly more, so I can really extend this base as much as I possibly want. I want this to be a modular base. I don't want to just set it up and forget it. If I want to add extensions to it in the future, I've always got that possibility. 
So we can see the payload fairing has well, <laughs> long gone. And what this is comprised of, we have a cupola module on the top. That way our astronauts or our kerbonauts get a fantastic view of the surface of the moon. And underneath that, we have an Apollo Block 4 habitation module. I really like using those for base parts. I think they look fantastic. And attached either side of that, we do have an additional two Block 3 habitation modules. So there is going to be plenty of room for Kerbonauts on this base. Bearing in mind that this is only going to be the first module that we set down, I do have a dedicated HAB module that has additional space for Kerbonauts. I'm not entirely sure how many I'm going to want on the surface of the moon at one time. That's another reason why I've made this modular. I can expand on it as much as I possibly want. But it would be nice to maybe get 20? On the surface of the moon that may be achievable we'll have to see if that is possible anyway we did perform our translunar injection with five advanced otv engines they are great because they have an insanely high specific impulse their specific impulse is about 492 in vacuum if i recall correctly and i did need all of that to actually get this component over to the moon it was really tight even with the 160 ton launch vehicle that I had designed for this. And one thing, I didn't even add any shielding onto this module whatsoever, and there is a reason for that. I am going to be using drills to drill up regolith so that I can add my own shielding on site. I am going to be utilizing in situ resource utilization. Yes, that is the entire purpose for this base. We want to harvest the moon of all of its special resources and try and make it as easy as possible to get to the surface and actually not carry any more than we need. Now that this has been added to the game, well, hopefully solar storms should be not something we don't have to worry about but we will have enough shielding on this to hopefully mitigate the worst of the problems anyway we can now see that we are getting very close to touching down on the surface of the moon once again using those twin super draco engines two sets of those to put this safely down on the surface and we have achieved that about three kilometers away from the lot so i've got a bit of driving to do but luckily due to the magic of video editing well you don't have to sit through all of that. And there is a little bit of a disclaimer for the lot and for this part of the base. Well, I got Kraken attacked quite frequently trying to trying to put some of these modules down. And there was an issue with Bon Voyage that I will kind of get more into detail later on in this episode. I'll show a little bit of a clip of that. But it meant that I had to do a lot of finicky stuff in order to make this work. But now we can see we are attempting to line up the back of the lot with the belline and attempt to dock. This was a lot easier said than done. And thankfully, due to the landing legs that I am using on that core stage, they are adjustable, but they're not really heavily adjustable. But they're adjustable enough that I can switch to that stage and lower and raise it ever so slightly. So if our base is on a slant, if it's on an incline, then hopefully that means we should always be able to dock to different parts of the base. And that is going to be so, so incredibly useful, putting this all together. With the first module down and the lot attached, it's time to turn to Cafe One, the crew access and future extensions module. So this is basically a set of hollow tubes that we're going to use to extend the base as much as we possibly can. The design that I did for this, so I built the entire design in the space plane hangar to begin with, because I really wanted to figure out how it would all piece together. I'm usually really bad at doing this. Usually I just kind of throw modules at each other, like, like I did with Solaris Station in the last episode. I designed all of those modules separately, and then it kind of ended up looking a bit like a jumbled mess. And I didn't want to do that for the lunar surface base. I wanted to make this look nice and clean and planned, essentially. I am now up to date on For All Mankind, and Jamestown has been a big inspiration for this build. And I know there has been people saying, call this definitely not Jamestown 2. I'm not going to call it that. This is the Lunar South Pole Outpost. The LSPO, yes. I love the Definitely Not series of names. Obviously, that came from Coming Home, but this is... that That's a Coming Home thing. This is this is the next millennia, and this will just be the LPSO. No, I said that wrong. The LSPO even. 
Here we go, we can reveal the two crew tubes that we have on the payload for this for this mission. And this goes a little bit funny. I used Infernal Robotics yet again to try and fit these nice and snugly inside the payload fairing. If I would have had those extended the way that I wanted them, there is no way that I would have been able to fit those inside. But we can already see, we are getting a little bit of wobble from those. And <laughs> trust me, that got a lot worse the more we go on. There we go. Now that the RL23P translunar injection stage has stopped, we could see that that got really bad really quickly. Anyway, we are now going to attempt to land this Olympus booster. And we lost a landing leg and came down way, way, way too hard. I have no idea what happened there. That was a much shallower trajectory than I usually go on for those. And I was going a lot slower than the initial Olympus landing that I did. And yet the overheating effects were way, way worse. Really confused me. But we have completed our translunar injection with the cafe module. And now we are on our way over to the moon. There we go. Hello, dear moon. We are attempting to, well, probably colonize you. I, I don't know. We're not really colonizing, but you know, we're going to attempt to set down a lot of kerbals. Once again, we can see <laughs> that those two kind of wings of this spacecraft are flapping in, well, they're not really flapping against anything, flapping in futile. <laughs> and everything, yeah, no. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Also, one of the Super Draco engines failed there, which obviously caused us to spin out quite badly. I was able to correct that and I landed manually rather than using MechJed's landing guidance to finish that. So that was that all done. Now, a month later, on the 13th of September, we are going to be launching the water module. That is the water and terrain extraction rig. This is going to be the first of the in-situ resource utilization modules that I send down to the surface of the moon. Essentially, this is going to have an entire, well, a boatload, if you will. I'm, it's not really a good way to describe this. It's going to have a lot of drills on it. It's got a lot of water drills and it also has a lot of regolith drills. I was talking earlier about regolith drills for shielding. So in the regolith drill itself, you can do a process using Kerbalism to convert regolith into shielding, which is going to be fantastic. It means we don't have to carry all of that really heavy shielding over. Other parts of this module do include an in-situ resource utilization unit in the center. What that is going to be able to do is electrolyze water into hydrogen and oxygen. I did already mention that earlier on in this episode, but that is going to be our one for the lunar base. And everything else is just fuel tanks. We've got water tanks, oxygen tanks, hydrolox tanks, and hydrogen tanks. All of the tanks that we are going to need in order to process Hydrolox on the surface. But we have finished our translunar injection and we are now on the way to the moon yet again. There is going to be a lot of <laughs> coming to the moon and performing some capture burns around the moon. There we go. The RL23P has been ignited yet again and it shouldn't take us an awful long time to slow down into a nice low lunar orbit and then decouple the translunar injection stage. Once again, we are going to have to perform a little bit of transposition and docking in order to maneuver this into the correct orientation so we can begin our descent onto the lunar surface. This, however, went a little bit harder than the last one that I attempted to do due to the fact that this spun and it didn't have any avionics on its stage so I couldn't stop it from spinning spinning. So I had to do this manually and well docking to spinning craft is it's pretty difficult but I would like to think that that has shown that my docking skills have got considerably better since I last attempted a manual docking. Yeah they went really badly. I think it was a live stream for coming home and it was oh it was terrible. But I did eventually manage to get the sky crane docked into the correct orientation on top of the mining rig and that meant we could start our descent firing up those four single Super Draco engines. We did have a permanent shutdown on one of those. Luckily though those engines have had four-way symmetry so I was able to turn off the opposite engine and bring this down nice and safely. We did have more than enough thrust to do this so of course this teaches the lesson. Redundancy is very important because if we didn't have those extra engines well that could have gone very badly. So earlier on, when I landed the cafe module, I sent the lot over to join it by using Bon Voyage Autopilot, which turned out to be a terrible, terrible mistake. As we can see on screen right now, 
on Voyage decided to put the craft inside each other and that meant whenever I tried to switch back to them, well, <laughs> you can see what happened on screen. Yes, they decided to blow up. So I hope you do not mind this, but what I did is every module that got wrecked by that, I did hyper edit back onto the surface of the moon due to the fact that it wasn't really a kind of failure as such it was more a game breaking feature it, it wasn't an actual failure it was a problem with the game so i felt like using hyper edit is probably it's, it's kind of necessitated or warranted in that situation and <laughs> i am a little bit worried though because i did use hyper edit to land things on the moon and those who have caught some of my recent live streams have noticed that when i was using hyper edit to test out some designs in that well, the moon no longer became tidally locked to the Earth, so I really hope I haven't broken the solar system by doing this. But anyway, the rest of this episode now, what we are going to be focusing on is manoeuvring all of these different pieces for the Lunar South Pole outpost and trying to connect them all together. This was a real pain. This was so difficult to do because those docking ports have to be aligned perfectly or near enough perfectly. And some of these modules were quite difficult to move around. These cafe modules, the extendable tubes or the, the kind of extensions for the base, they were relatively easy. They were quite heavy, but maneuverable enough that it wasn't really causing me any grief. We can see that the weight of the sky crane that brought down that cafe module has made this one tip up into, well, not the sky, because there isn't sky on the moon, but it's made it tip up more towards space. Luckily, though, due to those incredibly handy extendable legs that I do have on that cafe module or on every single module that I do have on this lunar surface outpost, I was able to correct this and connect it rather nicely once again to the lot tank. Not the lot tank, just the lot. The last T in lot stands for tank. It's like saying rip in pieces, rest in pieces in pieces. No, <laughs> well, we don't want that to happen to this base anytime soon. I, I think this should last quite a while. But here we are bringing in the second long tube to the main core of the base. Managed to line this up relatively nicely, grab those legs, extend them up, and of course, detach the tank yet again. And now the final module is the drill. And I have the sky crane on that drill. And because I've got the sky crane on that drill, it makes it really difficult to maneuver because that sky crane still has fuel in it. And it means that this is very, very heavy. I do want to keep it on though, because as it stands, the base does not have any avionics at all. So I have no way of controlling it. And that is going to be <laughs> a problem for a lot of reasons. What we saw there was known as a pro gamer move. That was a backflip to get the rover into a better position. No, that was a complete accident. And I was so incredibly fortunate that nothing broke off when that happened. I remember doing that and I was thinking, no, 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 no. I've spent far too long getting all of this together. Please don't break now. Anyway, the problem with avionics, without having control of the base, I would not be able to maneuver those legs into the correct position. And that means it would be a lot harder to dock different modules to it. If I can control those legs, it's going to make it a lot easier and I won't suffer as many headaches getting these all into position. However, <laughs> it did mean I had a big headache trying to maneuver this one solitary module. But there we go. We did indeed manage to dock this all together. And that will be the end of this episode. In the next episode, we will be carrying on work with the Lunar South Pole Outpost. Got a power module to put down, extra habitation, food. There's a whole lot to come. We'll also see what happened to those Mars missions, as well as maybe landing our first Kerbals on the surface of the moon. I hope you have enjoyed this. If you have, why not give it a like? If you really enjoyed it and would like to continue with the content on my channel, please do consider subscribing. I'd like to give a big thanks to the continued support from all of my patrons, and I have been Karnasa, and I will see you later.